I'm pleased to welcome back this week's sponsor, Studio Sweden. I've had my Studio headphones for a couple of weeks now, and I can't stop talking about them. The sound quality is incredible, and I have been really impressed with the battery life as well. Studio is offering Murder Road Trip listeners 15% off any purchase. Just follow the link in the show notes and use the code ROADTRIP. I'll be back to tell you a bit more about Studio later in the show. Welcome to Murder Road Trip. I'm your host, Haley. Joining me on today's road trip is return co-host Laura Taylor. Laura is my friend and the content editor of the show. She's also a huge true crime nerd. She has her headphones in, listening to podcasts 24-7. Laura, can you tell us about some of your favorite true crime podcasts? Well, of course, there's Murder Road Trip, on my very top, top faves. But I also love Case File, Court Junkie, Murder Dictionary, Crime and Sports, and Small Town Murder. I love those guys. And then another great one that I have just stumbled upon about a month or so ago is called Trace Evidence. It's a really great high quality podcast and the host does a phenomenal job at breaking down all of the information for his listeners. I also really like investigative podcasts like Truth and Justice, Undisclosed, Unconcluded, Up and Vanished, and so on. I know the last time you were on the podcast was for the Pizza Bomber, which is a Patreon episode. But we discussed on that episode that I have a really hard time with the unsolved cases. But you've brought a lot of those podcasts into my life. And recently, you've been having me listen to a lot of the investigative podcasts. And I'm thankful for that, though it's hard for me. (laughs) I am obsessed. I'm obsessed. I have no life. My life is podcast because... That's what gets me through the day. I just I just love listening to it and it just it feels like I learn a lot from them too. It's not just like the interesting aspect for the entertainment value. It's it's just it's also just like I learn a lot and I I've always loved the law. I've always loved watching court TV and like wanted to be a lawyer and I mean, it's just fun. I enjoy it. And for all the listeners out there, Laura is lying. She does have a life. Her life is just on the go constantly, and so podcasts are a good fit for her. (laughs) That's true. I mean, I listen to podcasts when I'm bringing the girls to school. I listen to podcasts when I'm folding laundry. I listen to podcasts while I go grocery shopping or going to the worst hell on earth, Costco. I hate that place so much, but I have to go there, and so podcasts get me through it. I listen to them always. (laughs) Where can listeners find you? Well, um, I think probably Facebook would be the best way to contact me. I do have a Twitter account and I have an Instagram, but I don't use Twitter like hardly at all because I don't understand it and I'm just old like that. But probably the best way to reach me would just be to look me up on Facebook, laura.taylor3. So you'd put in like facebook.com slash laura.taylor3. And that's how you can reach me. I wish you used Twitter more, but you feel that way with me about Instagram. So, <laughs> Laura and I will be snacking on two Virginia classics, peanuts and Virginia ham biscuits, as we make our way to Virginia to discuss serial killer Timothy Wilson Spencer. Laura, what made you pick Timothy Wilson Spencer for today's trip? Okay, so this is a hugely historic case that I had no idea about until recently. But for many reasons, that will probably become pretty clear as we go through this story. Um, It really blew my mind that I had not heard of any of this, especially since I've been listening to hours upon hours of true crime podcasts every week for so many years now. Also, the fact that it happened in my home state, and I had no idea, and I'm just shocked about that because... Well, you'll understand more at the end why I was so shocked about that. It's it's a pretty big, this is a pretty big case, so. It really is a huge case, and I hadn't heard of the case before you recommended that we do the case for the episode, and I was like, why hasn't every single true crime podcast covered this case? Exactly. It, it's so weird. It's it's shocking to me, and, and I think I've been researching this for a couple months now, preparing for, you know, our podcast episode with you today, but um, I, I just, I, I'm always looking for it. Like, all, I have, I'm subscribed to so many podcasts, and I'm just like, I'm always kind of looking out for it. Maybe I missed one. Maybe somebody did it, but I just missed it, but no, like, really, there's nobody that does this. Maybe a couple obscure ones, but pretty much there's just nothing out there about this case, and it's just super surprising. I agree. On that note, are you ready to go? I am ready. We 
lost the station again. Uh, keep trying. I'm safe. Hold on. Let me try this one. Stop. That's it. Turn it up. Turn it up. Timothy Wilson Spencer was born on March 17, 1962, in Arlington, Virginia. Timothy's parents went on to have another son whom they named Travis. When Timothy and Travis were young, their parents divorced. Timothy and Travis grew up in the Green Valley part of Arlington. Green Valley was not the best place for a mother to raise her two sons because it was really low income. Although Timothy was an intelligent child, he was considered to be a poor student. He began getting into trouble at a young age. At the age of just nine years old, Timothy urinated and defecated in the schoolyard. He would later go on to repeat this behavior again at age 12. Prior to 1984, Timothy was convicted of three counts of burglary as a juvenile. In 1984, he was convicted of three more counts of burglary as well as three counts of trespassing. For these crimes, Timothy was sentenced to three years in prison. When Timothy finished his prison sentence, he was transferred into a nonviolent offender halfway house that was located in the south side area of Richmond, Virginia. Timothy was considered to be nonviolent because of the fact that he had been convicted for burglary rather than a crime labeled by the law to be violent, like armed battery, assault, rape, or murder. The halfway house rules were lax. If an offender wanted to leave the house, they simply had to sign in and out every time they went somewhere. It is said that the already lax rules were rarely monitored or enforced in any kind of consistent manner. On September 18, 1987, Timothy signed out of the halfway house at 7.30 p.m. and walked just over two miles to Debbie Dudley Davis's Richmond, Virginia home. Debbie, a 35-year-old account manager, talked on the phone with her parents from 8.30 to 9 p.m. Sometime after 9 p.m., Timothy stole a rocking chair off a nearby porch and positioned it under Debbie's kitchen window. He then entered through Debbie's kitchen window and attacked Debbie in her bedroom. Timothy used shoestrings to bind Debbie's left wrist in front of her body and her right wrist behind her body. Timothy fashioned a sort of garrote with socks and a section of a vacuum cleaner pipe. Timothy attached the garrote around Debbie's neck to the shoelaces he tied around her wrists. He then tied the garrote around Debbie's neck two to three times, cutting her neck muscles, larynx, and voice box in the process. He then raped and killed her by strangulation. The next day, Debbie's vehicle was found running a few blocks away from her apartment. When police ran the license plate, they saw that it came back as belonging to Debbie. So they noted the address and headed over to her house to investigate the abandoned vehicle situation further. When police arrived at the apartment, they found a horrific scene. Debbie was found face down on the bed, naked, with only her shorts on. While processing the crime scene, investigators found large amounts of semen. This led investigators to theorize that the subject likely masturbated more than one time before fleeing the scene. Investigators also recovered two hairs on or near Debbie's body. After testing the semen and the hairs, investigators concluded that the hairs came from a, quote, Negro man's underarm, and the semen was from a secretor, meaning that blood-type antigens were found among the semen. The autopsy showed Debbie's cause of death as ligature strangulation. On October 2, 1987, Timothy left the halfway house and walked to the Richmond home of 32-year-old neurosurgeon Susan Helms. He entered her house by cutting the screen out of her second-story bedroom window. After entering, Timothy attacked Susan and tied her wrists behind her back with an extension cord and a belt. He then tied two belts around Susan's neck and another belt around the lower part of her leg. Timothy then proceeded to rape and eventually murder Susan. At approximately 1.30 a.m. on October 3rd, Susan's husband, Marcel, returned home and found his wife's lifeless body on the floor of their bedroom closet. When investigators arrived, they found an eerily similar scene to that of Debbie Dudley Davis. Once again, they discovered large amounts of semen. After testing the semen, 
Investigators found that it was consistent to the semen found at Debbie's house. They also found that Susan's cause of death was ligature strangulation. After word got out that multiple women in the area had been killed in the same manner, the media named the murder suspect the South Side Strangler. The original FBI profile stated that the suspect was likely a white male, approximately 35 years of age, a loner, intelligent, not a beginner criminal, and likely had success as a cat burglar due to his ability to enter residences without making a sound. The media's attention on the Southside Strangler created a wave of panic amongst Richmond residents. People began buying deadbolts, keeping their lights on, and arming their homes with guard dogs in order to regain a sense of security. Police knew the panic would only escalate if they did not find their suspect, so they worked tirelessly to find a link between each victim. While searching for a link, Richmond police detective Joe Horgas came across information about a serial rapist in Arlington, Virginia. Arlington is about two hours away from Richmond, located in the northern Virginia area and borders Washington, D.C. This perpetrator was known as the Black Masked Rapist. The rapist, a black man in his 20s, was believed to have burglarized and raped at least nine women in the Arlington area between June of 1983 and January of 1984. Detective Horgas also learned about the murder of an Arlington woman by the name of Carolyn Carol Ham. Carol's murder was ominously similar to the murders of both Debbie Dudley Davis and Susan Helms. On January 25, 1984, Carol Ham was raped, bound, and murdered in her Arlington home. When the 32-year-old attorney didn't arrive at work on the 26th or the 27th, Carol's secretary called Darla Henry, Carol's friend. Darla arrived at Carol's house and found that the front door was open. Darla asked one of Carol's neighbors, Larry, to go into the house with her. Upon entering, Darla discovered Carol's body naked and face down on the floor. Carol's hands had been tied behind her back with a Venetian blind cord. It was later determined that she had been hanged to death. On January 29, 1984, Larry's sister, Muriel, called the police to tell them about a suspicious man named David Vasquez she had seen in the neighborhood on the evening of the 23rd of January. On the 30th, another one of Carol's neighbors, Michael, called police and said he had also seen the suspicious man named David Vasquez in the neighborhood on January 25th. Police followed up on the two tips they received and asked David, a 38-year-old janitor with an IQ of 70, to come in for questioning on February 4th. During his interview with police, David told them that he was not in Arlington on January 23rd or January 25th. He also told police that he did not drive and had no way of getting to the Arlington area on that night. He lived about 30 miles away in Manassas. The interview lasted for many hours, and the police spent the entire time coercing a confession out of David. They asked nonstop leading questions. For example, at one point, police were trying to get David to tell them what he used to tie Carol up. He said, quote, a coat hanger? And police said, quote, no, it wasn't a coat hanger. Remember cutting the Venetian blind cord? This coercion and trickery led to David giving them exactly what they wanted a full confession, albeit a completely false confession. A few days later, police realized they had not read David his Miranda rights, so they had to redo the entire interview all over again. When the two interrogators went to redo their interview, David once again told them that he had nothing to do with the murder. After an hour, one interrogator left the room with a tape recorder. When the interrogator re-entered with the tape recorder, David was suddenly ready to tell them all those horrible dreams he had had. The dream David went on to describe was similar to the things police had told David had occurred at the crime scene. At the end of describing his dream, David Vasquez was arrested and charged for the murder of Carol Ham. He would later end up taking a plea deal to avoid the death penalty and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. After researching the nine rapes in Carol's murder, Detective Horgas began to think that the nine rapes in the murder of Carol Ham in Arlington and the murders of Debbie and Susan in Richmond were possibly all connected to one another. But if they were connected, then that meant that David Vasquez could not have been Carol's murderer, since David was in jail during the time that the other crimes occurred. 
Detective Horgus was faced with the terrible thought that Carol's murderer was still out there, and there was an innocent man sitting in prison for a murder he didn't commit. Detective Horgus contacted Arlington Detective Williams to discuss the connections. Horgus told Williams about the DNA testing they had been doing, and how the DNA showed that the suspect was a black male. Detective Williams was initially skeptical of Horgus's theory for many reasons, including the distance between Richmond and Arlington, over 100 miles, and the fact that the FBI profile of the Southside Strangler pointed to a white man as the likeliest perpetrator, not a black man. Although Williams did not 100% agree with his theory, Horgus kept working the connection. On November 21, 1987, the Southside Strangler would strike again. This time, the victim was a 15-year-old high school student by the name of Diane Cho, who had spent the evening studying in her Richmond bedroom. She went to sleep at around 10 p.m. that evening. Six miles away, Timothy Spencer was signing out of his halfway house at about 7.15 p.m. He then walked the six miles to Diane Cho's apartment. At some point during the night, Timothy quietly snuck in through Diane's window. He was able to attack her so quickly that she never made a sound and her parents in the next room over did not hear a thing. Timothy duct taped Diane's mouth and bound her hands behind her back with rope. Then he tied a rope around her neck and tied each end of the neck rope to the rope around her hands. Timothy then raped and strangled Diane just as he had Debbie and Susan. Before exiting her room, Timothy painted an infinity symbol on Diane's left hip with nail polish. The next day, around 2 p.m., Diane's parents came home to check on Diane. They thought she had stayed home sick from school. When her parents entered her room, they found Diane naked, face down on the bed, partially covered by a sheet. Just as they had at the previous crime scenes, technicians took DNA samples. Diane's cause of death was determined to be from ligature strangulation. Although the exact date is not known, it is believed that on November 27, 1987, federal employee Susan Tucker was at her Arlington, Virginia home. The 44-year-old's husband was away on a business trip, so she had the entire house to herself. Timothy was on a furlough to spend Thanksgiving with his mother in Arlington. At some point during his stay, Timothy left his mother's house and walked a mile to Susan Tucker's house. Timothy was able to easily enter through Susan's sliding basement window. He found Susan and tied a rope around her neck. Timothy then used the ends of the neck rope to tie Susan's hands behind her back. He then raped and murdered Susan Tucker. Susan Tucker's body was found nude, lying on the bed, partially covered on December 1st. It was determined that she had been dead for three to five days, and she had died of ligature strangulation. DNA was also found and swabbed at the scene. And now, a quick word from today's sponsor. Like I said earlier, I have been using my studio headphones for a few weeks now, and I absolutely love them. They quickly and easily paired with my devices, and I was using them within a minute. I listen to podcasts constantly, so I need headphones that will be comfortable all day and that won't run out of battery by lunchtime. My studio headphones have not let me down. They are so lightweight and comfortable, it's almost as if I'm not wearing anything, and the battery lasts all day. Their slim and stylish design their slim and stylish design means they look great and don't get in the way, while still blocking out the noise. I love that Studio offers free worldwide shipping, which makes them ideal. I love that Studio offers free worldwide shipping, which make them the ideal gift for friends and family overseas. Make sure you take advantage of their special offer for Murder Road Trip listeners. Just go to studiosweden.com and enter Road Trip to receive 15% off any purchase. That's studiosweden, S-U-D-I-O, sweden.com and enter Road Trip. Now back to the show. In late December of 1987, Detective Horgas submitted his evidence and theory to the Behavioral Analysis Unit at the FBI headquarters. After looking over the evidence Horgas had submitted, the FBI was able to reaffirm his theory. The crimes in Arlington and the crimes in Richmond were committed by the same person. 
The unit suggested that Horgas search for a suspect in recent prison records. He needed to be looking for an offender who was arrested after Carol Ham's murder in 1984 and released just before the murder of Debbie Dudley Davis in 1987. Horgas and his partner, Mike Hill, sorted through over 300 files to try and find an offender who fit their timeline. After four days of searching, Horgas suddenly remembered arresting a man named Timmy for burglary around the timeline they were searching for. On January 6, 1988, Horgas finally remembered Timmy's last name. He searched for Timothy Spencer and found that he fit the timeline perfectly. Horgas also found that after serving his three-year sentence for the 1984 burglary, Timothy was released to a halfway house just two weeks before Debbie was murdered. Horgas also discovered that Timothy's mother lived less than one mile from both of the Arlington murder scenes. Horgas knew he had the right man. He just had to figure out how to obtain the perfect arrest warrant. On January 20th, 1988, after obtaining an arrest warrant for burglary, police arrested 25-year-old Timothy at the Richmond Halfway House. When police searched his bedroom, they found an infinity sign and the words, I hope, on the mattress box spring. While at the station, Timothy refused to talk to police. Because he wouldn't talk, police asked Timothy to consent to a blood sample. Police told Timothy they wanted a blood sample so they could test it against blood found at a recent burglary. Timothy agreed, not knowing that police would really be testing his blood against the secretions found at the crime scenes of Debbie Dudley Davis, Susan Hellum, Diane Cho, and Susan Tucker. As Timothy sat in jail, police anxiously waited for the DNA results to come back. On March 16th, they were finally ready. The DNA test results showed that Timothy's DNA matched the DNA that was found at each woman's home. His DNA also matched the DNA from the 1984 rape and murder of Carol Ham in Arlington. Although police had their perfect match, DNA had never been used in a United States court to convict someone before. A special hearing was held to find out if prosecutors could introduce DNA evidence into the trial. It was ruled that prosecutors could indeed introduce the DNA evidence. Timothy was then charged with the murders of all four women. Police still had the Carol Ham DNA match to deal with, though. This DNA match wasn't as simple as the other four matches. There was already a man behind bars for the 1984 rape and murder. Because there was not enough DNA evidence taken from the Carol Ham crime scene to exonerate David, only the governor could do that. Detectives continued to build the case to prove that David was innocent. Timothy's first trial was for the rape and capital murder of Susan Tucker. The trial began on July 11, 1988, and it lasted for only five days. This trial was the first U.S. trial to ever use DNA evidence as a means to link a criminal to a crime. On July 16, 1988, it only took six hours for the jury to find Timothy guilty of both charges. He was later sentenced to life for the rape conviction, and then he received a death sentence for the murder conviction. The next trial was for Debbie Dudley Davis. Timothy was charged with burglary, rape, and capital murder. Once again, DNA evidence was introduced and used to help convict Timothy. On September 22, 1988, Timothy was convicted of all three charges. He was later sentenced to 20 years for the burglary, and he received a life sentence for the rape and a death sentence for the murder. The third trial held was for the burglary, rape, forcible sodomy, and capital murder of Susan Hellams in January of 1989. DNA evidence was also used to help convict Timothy of all four charges. He was later sentenced to 20 years for the burglary. He received a life sentence for the rape, a life sentence for the forcible sodomy, and a death sentence for the murder. Although there was not enough DNA evidence found at Diane Cho's apartment, prosecutors were still able to secure a conviction for burglary, rape, and capital murder. Timothy was later sentenced to 20 years for the burglary. He received a life sentence for the rape and a death sentence for the murder. In early 1989, after hearing the overwhelming circumstantial evidence that Timothy Spencer was 
Carol Ham's murderer, David Vasquez received a pardon from the Virginia governor. In 1990, David was awarded $65.41 for each of the 1,796 days that he had spent wrongfully behind bars for a total of $117,000. David was the first American man to be exonerated based on DNA evidence. Timothy was not charged for the murder of Carol Ham because he was already sentenced to multiple death sentences. On April 27, 1994, 32-year-old Timothy Wilson Spencer was executed in the electric chair at Greensville Correctional Center in Jarrett, Virginia. He was pronounced dead at 11.13 p.m. He did not have any final words. In 1989, the multiple convictions against Timothy prompted the state of Virginia to create the first state DNA laboratory and the first DNA database in the United States. In 1992, Benjamin Cadorzo created the Innocence Project, a nonprofit that helps exonerate innocent people through DNA evidence. In later interviews, Timothy's younger brother, Travis, said that he was extremely surprised by his older brother's actions. Of course, Timothy was a hellion when he was younger, but Travis never expected his older brother to go out and kill women. Travis told a story about how when they were younger, Timothy got caught shoplifting, and Timothy told Travis, don't be like me when you're older. So it's really sad to think about the fact that this younger brother looked up to his older brother and could not see Timothy being this violent. What do you think about that? He really couldn't. And I think, actually, what I think about that is that I have family members who may be able to be put into this type of category as Timothy Spencer. Not like that bad, but like a mindset that you don't really expect is what I'm saying. And I have to, I don't, I could never imagine them doing things and then they do them. And it's just like shocking. And I kind of think it kind of makes me feel very unsettled and untrusting of people in general, because I wonder like, if this person that I thought that I loved so much and was such a sweet, wonderful, kind-hearted person could do something like that, like, what could anybody do? And how do I trust anyone? You know, it's, it's, it's weird, but I can understand that. I mean, you want to love your brother. You want to love your family members and believe that they are great people and kind-hearted, loving people. And I can't even imagine having, like, one of my siblings or one of my family members come out and find out that they did something so horrific like I can't imagine I'm sure that I would be exactly the same as this guy and be like they were so amazing they're such great a great person they're a loving person like how do you say anything otherwise but that's kind of how these things go right and I'm going to play devil's advocate here and say that Timothy had to lay low under the radar he couldn't act like what we think of as a serial killer or else he would have gotten caught much earlier. So of course his younger brother didn't see it coming. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, I think that, I mean, I've listened to enough stories about these types of serial killers where I'm learning that all of their loved ones don't believe they could do it because they don't want to believe that. They're not looking for those signs. They're not trying to see oh, he's acting suspicious, he's acting weird, he's acting, he's acting like sociopathic or whatever. They, they're just seeing this nice person and they're trying to find the best in him, just like we all do with all of our loved ones. I mean, it'd be weird to do otherwise, to be a suspicious person and constantly think the worst of anybody. That'd be weird. So, I mean, it always makes sense when, you know, family members of BTK or um, Jeffrey Dahmer or you know, Ted Bundy, they all come out and say, he was such a sweet person. He was such a great person I could never imagine. Well, that's because you don't want to imagine. And that makes sense. And that's like something that we need to do for survival. We need to be able to trust people and love our loved ones and not think horrible things about them. I could not agree with you more. Like you said, we don't want to think that way about anybody in our lives. And so of course, you're not going to think that until it comes out in the news. Do you have any final thoughts on Timothy Wilson Spencer? I would just I would just say that uh, this case was so incredibly fascinating to me 
because of all the firsts that came about because of it. I mean, first DNA criminal case in U.S. history, first person to be exonerated through DNA with David Vasquez. Um, Virginia was the first state to create a DNA laboratory and was also the first state to create a DNA database. So, I mean, this specific case just got the ball rolling in so many ways. It's incredible. Um, and then also the fact that, you know, David Vasquez was exonerated and then um, that other guy, what's his name? Sorry, miss forgot his name, uh, started the Innocence Project. I don't know if it was the first Innocence Project, but it was one for sure. It was one of the very early ones. I think that this, this case was so historic in so many ways. I agree. And that's why we were so surprised as to why this case hasn't been covered by like every true crime podcast. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's shocking to me because I mean, so I listen to so many podcasts and so many of them come out with these very like unknown cases. And I'm just surprised that this one isn't one of the top ones because it just, it has so many firsts and it, it is so uh, such a big deal. It really made an impact on the on the criminal justice system. And um, also, I wanted to say one one big thing about this case was that I mean, I hear so many horrible stories about bad police work, where they just don't care, or they don't care about certain you know minorities, or they just don't they just don't want to put the effort in. And I'm not saying that all police departments are this way. I don't believe that. I don't want to believe that. I believe that they're mostly good, but I do hear about messed up bad police work all the time. And this one was, was awesome because for once I get to talk about a police officer and, and detectives and his team that actually did a really great job and they worked tirelessly to, to, not only find the right guy, but also make sure that that innocent man was released from prison. And you don't, you just don't hear about that very often. I'm not saying it doesn't happen very often, but I don't hear about it very often. So it was actually really nice to hear that and very refreshing to know that there are good police officers that are willing to go the extra mile to make sure that justice is done properly and fairly. Yeah, that was one of the really great parts about this case is that not only did Detective Horgus work tirelessly to find the killer, but he also worked really hard to exonerate David Vasquez. And although, you know, five women died, that's horrific. There is still a positive outcome from this case. And sometimes when we hear true crime stories, there isn't a positive at the end. Right. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, at least we can say a lot of, I mean, it's so sad that those women had to lose their lives, but they didn't die in vain. I mean, their deaths made so much happen, so much progress occur with, I mean, this, you know, the Innocence Project, the the DNA database, the DNA laboratory, all these things, the first, they're just they, their family members, their loved ones can know that their deaths were not in vain and that they absolutely stood for something and made huge progress. Well, thank you for coming along for the ride, Laura. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Until next time, please remember to check your back seats and I'll see you at the next rest stop. If you didn't know already, you can also listen to me on the We're All Just Pretending podcast where I give bad advice on purpose. You can also find Jess and me on the Playlist podcast. Playlist is a podcast where Josh Hallmark of Our Americana and the Karen and Ellen Letters has different podcasters on to talk about their favorite songs. Every episode has a different theme in a new panel of podcasters. You can find Murder Road Trip at murderroadtrip.com on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Trip, and on Facebook at Murder Road Trip Podcast. If you're interested in continuing the discussion, you can join the Murder Road Trip Podcast group on Facebook. Make sure to check out the Murder Road Trip playlist on Spotify. 
You can even add songs to the playlist. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Please stay tuned after the music to hear from some other great podcasts. The Fall Line is a true crime audio serial that investigates cold cases in marginalized southeastern communities. Our first season, which has just been re-recorded, edited, and re-released, covered the case of missing Augusta, Georgia twins, Danette and Jeanette Millbrook, who disappeared in 1990. In season 1.5, we covered the 1989 disappearance of Brunswick, Georgia siblings, Monica and Michael Bennett. Our second season, premiering in spring 2018, is our biggest yet. The story of multiple infants stolen from an Atlanta hospital, Grady Memorial, a facility that has been identified as having the highest newborn abduction rate in the nation. Two of those children are still missing today. We hope you'll join us as we search for answers in the cases of Tavish Sutton and Raymond Green and cover the stories of the babies who were eventually found and discover why so many have disappeared from Brady in the first place. Our season preview drops February 20th, and we hope you'll tune in. What if your loved one went missing? What would you do to get them back? Police have been looking for Ivan Aguilar. He went missing in May 2014 at the I age of about a little girl who seemingly vanished from Milwaukee. Yeah, Alexis Patterson. Walker is reported missing by his adoptive father. We started this podcast to help find the missing who aren't otherwise covered in the media. We call, we request information. We're still left with nothing and we need your help to solve them. Somebody out there has to know something. Mommy wants you I miss her. I miss her. Join us for our true crime podcast that covers the disappearances of missing minorities and LGBTQ persons. These cases are solvable. Someone just needs to listen. This is the Missing Minority Project podcast.